Thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, although what you neglected to mention was I was born in Jamaica Hospital. I spent my childhood in Rockville Center, and I spent my adolescence in Fairfield, Connecticut. So my Manhattan friends tell me I'm at least a bridge and tunnel New Yorker. If you. So, you know, there are many organizations that are focused on specific diseases and specific cancers, but, but history has taught us that, for example, the next breakthrough in pancreatic cancer might come from someone working on pancreatic cancer, but if I was betting, I would say it's more likely to come from some other smart person, perhaps working on some other type of cancer, or, or frankly, maybe not even working on a specific type of cancer at all. Maybe they're working on fundamental cancer mechanisms in a model organism, such as uh, the fruit fly. Uh, so to use a sports analogy, uh, we don't draft by uh, position, we simply look for the best athletes. We're trying to find young geniuses, we try to properly resource them, and then we don't put blinders on them, and we say go make great discoveries. And that's the way the scientific process really works. Now I want to talk to you about one particular type of scientist that we support, namely uh, physician scientist. Now, physician scientists, perhaps not surprisingly, are often the natural bridges to take discoveries in the laboratory all the way forward to the clinic. And, and I, I suspect all of you have heard of some famous physician scientists, whether it's Alexander Fleming and penicillin. Uh, I remember in Rockville Center lining up for my polio vaccine and hearing about Jonas Salk, or Sidney Farber, who was the, the father of modern chemotherapy. So all three of these individuals were physician scientists. And it turns out there, there are two flavors of physician scientists. There are the MD PhDs and the MD onlys. So the MD, and they make up about 50-50 currently of the American physician scientist workforce. So the MD PhDs often knew at a very early age they were gonna be scientists. Uh, as a result, they not infrequently sort of take some shortcuts during their clinical training because they know their future really is going to lie uh, in the laboratory. Uh, but then there's another group, and in the interest of full disclosure, I, I belong to this group, who completed all of their clinical training and said, you know, enough. We, we have to do better, and the only way to do better is to go back in the laboratory to try to generate some new knowledge and to join the fight to sort of push the field forward. So again, these, these are often referred to as the, the late bloomers or the MD-only physician scientists. And again, with my disclosure already given, I'm, I'm actually quite proud of the fact that I would argue that MD-onlys historically have sort of punched above uh, their, their weight class. Uh, and so, for example, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Harold Varmus in the, in the front row. He's an MD-only who won the Nobel Prize with another MD-only, Mike Bishop, for the discovery of cancer genes. I could go on and on and on, but I'll just give you one more example. Some of you may have heard of this revolutionary immunotherapy for the most common form of childhood leukemia that's based on re-engineering the patient's own T cells. These are so-called CAR T cells. These, this was really spearheaded by an MD-only physician scientist, Carl June, at the University of Pennsylvania. The problem is we're, we're in danger of losing the MD-onlys because some things have changed. One is that they're now often finishing their clinical training drowning in school debt. Uh, and I can tell you that makes uh, private practice uh, look, begin to look quite attractive for some of these people. Uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, because they are late to the game, when they go to get that first grant, uh, they often look quite inexperienced compared to their PhD and MD, PhD colleagues, and so it's very difficult for them to get funding. So we at the Damon Runyon had the idea, why don't we create a mechanism where these talented young physicians finishing their clinical training can go into a first-rate lab with a first-rate mentor, have protected time for about four years, and learn the skills it takes to be a successful uh, physician scientist. Uh, and frankly, this would have been a great idea that would have sat on the blackboard uh, if it wasn't for Lee Cooperman and Michael Gordon having the vision and the generosity to step up to the plate and make this program uh, into a reality. Uh, so you're gonna hear from two of our physician uh, scientist awardees today. I'd first like to invite Melody Smith from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to uh, share some reflections with us. Thank you, Melody. Thank you. 